Hello and welcome to WCET's first webcast of the year, Issues and Trends in EdTech in 2014, a conversation with WCET's leadership. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Events and Programs Manager at WCET. And it's great to see so many of our friends here. Looks like we have 46 people so far. We had about 150 registered, so we're expecting quite a few people to witness our visionaries and their, their future forecasting. I want to send a quick thank you to Blackboard Collaborate for making this platform available. If at any time you have any technical issues, please contact them directly. And I'll go ahead and put that number into the chat, bo chat box for your reference. And as we go through the conversation today, the presenters are the ones with mic privileges. So feel free to engage in the conversation through the chat box. We'll be monitoring that and pulling out your questions as we go. We are recording this presentation and we'll make the access to the archive along with the PowerPoint and any resources that are shared on our website and I'll also email that out to all registrants. As you have questions or comments or if you want to share your own future forecast of what EdTech is going to look like in 2014, go ahead and enter that into the chat box. Our moderator today will be pulling out those questions and then we'll get to those in the latter portion of the presentation. We have a, quite a lineup today. Our moderator is Richie Boyd, who many of you know from our PK sessions and at the annual meeting. Richie is our steering committee chair this year. He's an academic technology specialist at Montana State University up in Bozeman. And assisting him will be Mike Garn who has recently joined the University of System Georgia, Deb Gar Gerhardt, Vice Provost for eLearning at Ohio University, and Pat James, who has recently joined WCET as a leadership fellow. Now I'd like to pass it off to Richie to begin the conversation. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, I don't really have much to add at this point because I want to be able to dig right into the presentation. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Deb Gerhardt to talk about uh, where the, the speaking order will be Deb, then Mike, then Pat, and so I just want to hand it right off to Deb and uh, let her sink her teeth into. Uh, thank you very much, Richie, and um, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're at. Um, when I was thinking about getting ready for this presentation, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go back and look at the Horizon port, uh, report to see what the trends were. If you're not familiar with the Horizon Report, um, it's put together by New Media Consortium and the Educause Learning Initiative. And they, report, they put a report out every year which kind of gives you what the hot topics are in technology in higher education. Um, and so the topics that they, you know, in the areas they had addressed in the 2013 report were MOOCs. And then I want to add the derivatives of that. I've seen some reports on some versions of that. One is the SMOC, the Synchronous Massive Online Course, and the other is the DOC, the Distributed Open Collaborative Course. And so, you know, there's, there was this kind of venture forward in online learning. Um, tablet computing, and tablet computing has been kind of on their radar for a while, but, you know, bring your own device is becoming more popular. Games and gamification, each year that um, there's been more and more use of this strategy. Um, learning analytics, and, you know, we'll be talking a little bit big data as we go through um, the webinar today. Um, 3D printing has started to come to the forefront. And I have to tell you, I saw a really interesting um, news clip about a father who bought a 3D printer for about $2,000. And what he had done was he had a son who needed a, a hand prosthetic. And they worked together and created their hand prosthetic. So instead of paying the thousands and thousands of dollars it would take to keep having a new prosthetic every time the young man grew, they had designed this on a 3D printer and they make it work. And each time you use a new one, you're going to print it off the 3D printer. So that's just one way that some of the technology can be used. And wearable technology, and that's becoming more popular. And if you were at the, um, the annual meeting, you had an opportunity probably to hear Ellen Wagner, um, our own Ellen Wagner, talk about and use and show you the Google Glasses. So that's another up and coming area. 
I also was looking at um, some trends that I saw in the higher edu inside higher education last week. And so I picked up some things that I thought would also relate to educational technology. I mean, one of the big things that's coming up that we hear a lot about is competency um, as based education. And in 2014, you're going to be talking more about proficiency. And then you're also looking at you know, the value pro proposition and customer satisfaction, and we use a lot of technology in doing with this. But really looking at the big data and what's going to come into is more micro-targeting. Now, I know that that's used a lot in like your enrollment management, enrollment services, but I also see that that can be, in, you know, the over-enrolling under matches, that can also be used for managing the technology-based classroom, whether it be face-to-face, -face, blended, or online. So where do I see us going? I see that universities are going to have to find the right mix of where open courses in whatever format belong in, uh, for their own needs. Um, here at Ohio University, you know, one of the areas that was talked of, one college has talked about MOOCs a little bit has been our health professionals and sciences. They have global health. They have a global health unit that they need to put in its content across other health-related fields. And so that's the possibility of using the MOOC concept and adapting it. So I think universities are going to look at the right way and the right mix to use those. Um, I think that universities need to support the tablets and other mobile devices. You know, finding out how best to use them educationally is probably the challenge. But that's another thing that Ohio University is very open to meeting the technology needs of bring your own device in no matter what kind of devices. And then I think the toughest things for institutions and tech departments to look at is the challenge in finding and um, implementing the right tools. Um, so that's really looking at do you have the resources to get the tools you need? Are you getting the right tools? Are you getting the right training? Are you getting them out to the right people? So for really in a tech department, that's a challenge. And then of course data, data, data. We've been hearing a lot about big data, learning analytics, you know, micro targeting, you know, how are we going to figure this all out? That is one of the trends and issues, you know, it's one of the trends that's going to be one of the issues. And then keeping, just keeping up with technology, that has always been a challenge in higher education. It's to the devices that they bring, to the wearable technology. I mean, you know, how, how can an institution who, you know, is kind of a big um, bureaucracy, a big organism, try to keep up with all the little technology nuances that keep coming in? How does it affect education and privacy? That's something else that's been coming up. And, you know, what are other educational concerns around that? So, you know, one of the projects that I have to be working on with a colleague here is related to looking at some of this data. Been looking at, you know, the McCullough's been looking at data on non-completion, particularly looking at that DWF rate. And, you know, how can that be used in regular courses and remedial courses? So what are the right tools in course design to improve completion? You know, improving completion, retention, and it helps the university we, you know, generate more resources and revenue. So, you know, I, I look at this from my administrator hat and I'm looking at, you know, how can we use educational technology to really improve the courses and help retain um, to completion our um, students. Because, you know, in the state of Ohio, that's one of our um, goals that we must meet and record back to the Board of Regents is our completion. So that's just my little few minutes on where I see some of the techno technology trends are and where I see some of the issues going on to it. So this time I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Actually, if I can take a brief second uh, to encourage folks if they have questions to enter them in the chat box and Megan and I will keep track of it. And while Mike is getting prepped, we've got about an, an extra minute here. I am curious, Deb, um, you know, you talk about how, you know, keeping up, and I'm wondering how, you know, what do you see as, a, as the major impacts on an institution for things like faculty development and how they, basically, how they address the issue of keeping up with all these things? Well, I think the biggest thing is that a lot of faculty do like to go to the conferences and out and investigate new technology. So I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges I see here and I've seen at other places is faculty will come back with this whole um, great idea of things they want to use, but it's often the institutional um, 
of bureaucracy, you know, the, the way they go for approvals and getting OIT involved and how they're going to do everything, it, it, uh, it stifles a lot of, of moving forward quickly with technologies. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's one of the institutional ways that um, it, it hampers how we do. That's one of our big issues. All right, thanks very much. Mike, are you ready? You know, thanks, Richie. I am just so ready. It's going to be a great year out there. So, everybody, uh, glad you're on board. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, while I have been working with, I joined full time the University System of Georgia uh, about mid December. In my new position, uh, working with new learning models, is really to take a lot of the things and, and think about things that the university system is doing well now, uh, but based on a lot of the things we've learned over the last 10, 15 years and what we think is coming next, really begin thinking about how do we get uh, a lot of our projects connected to and new projects developed to get us kind of an on-ramp uh, for what we think is coming next. So what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of an idea of some of the things I'll be focusing on over the next year, so the priorities and the activities and the needs I see coming up there. Uh, I want to start off with something, and this comes from uh, New York Times did an article uh, on Google and their uh, mapping uh, program. This was in December. It's called Google's Roadmap to Global Domination. And they really tried to position where mapping came in in terms of uh, uh, competition uh, and ownership of, of the, those eyeballs in the Internet. So what they said is this Internet uh, domination uh, can be reduced to three key battles over three conceptual territories. What came first? And, and that was conquered by Google's superior search algorithms. Who was next? And Facebook uh, was clearly the victor in that area. But they say the where question, uh, which they uh, in the argue, in the article argue is maybe the biggest prize of all, uh, has yet to be completely won. And that's what Google is competing to take over when you want to know where. Something they left out of that to me uh, is kind of that how and the why. And I think that's the domain of education. And something that article kind of talks about kind of how you extend out leadership and ownership of those kind of areas and those questions. And it really gives you some good ideas for thinking about why we need to be involved in online learning uh, and, and doing different things. So my new role is uh, learning uh, new learning models. Uh, it's really about uh, looking for that opportunity space when technology kind of catalyzes teaching and learning. The things that I'm looking at, uh, and one, I guess I'd say the thing I'm not looking at uh, directly uh, is big data. We're hearing all of this stuff, but I tend to look at this from the academic side. Uh, how do we ha build adaptive engines? How do we personalize learning? And my contention is this is very important. This is what we talk about, but also there's very little of this that we can actually do right now. Uh, great data that we get from learning management systems and we're learning how to better mine that, but it's not granular enough and it's not really competencies tied to assessments that are tied to feedback and that really give us this, this positive uh, uh, loop uh, that we can put together, at least something we can personalize. We see early things, and I think we're going to see more. What we're missing is a very flexible middleware. Right now, the leading things like Newton and Alex are really hard-coded to link these things together, and they don't want, allow a lot of user input. If we want to move to OER content and things like that, they're not prepared to be the tools for us. So big promise, but I don't see much coming on that uh, in the next year. What I do see and what we need to be working on is this area of competency-based education. I don't think uh, that's any uh, surprise to anybody. Um, what we need in that area, though, is one, to clarify competing dialogues. Here in Georgia, we have the complete 
College Georgia initiative, which is huge. And we think about uh, adult learners and the use of competency-based tools like CLEP and PLA uh, and ACE and other things uh, to allow enable that type of learner to bring in experiences and get credit for them. And that's great. But I think the, the real area we need to get involved is making sure we have explicit competencies built in to the educational uh, uh, programs that we have now down at a modular assignment uh, and even lower level. Right now, we're pretty good on, on programs, not too bad on courses. But once it gets below that, and we need to get much more granular, it's not really there. So one of the things we'll be doing in Georgia is more and more uh, of the projects that we're uh, proposing to fund in RFPs will require, as part of that development, that there be explicit competencies uh, noted in that so that we really begin developing the ones and zeros that we need to link those competencies to assessments in a much more flexible manner. Uh, and the other is when we tell that to institutions, what kind of rubric are we going to give them? What are we going to mean? And I'm not sure what that is. I can think of a lot of things. Common Core State Standards out of K-12 gives us some idea of how granular you can get. I'm not sure that's going to be amenable to a lot of institutions, but that's the kind of area we're going to be exploring of how do we take this down one, two, maybe three more levels of detail from where we are now and begin making it part of what we do for normal academic courses and programs, not just uh, as a pathway into education and to credit for adult learners. Uh, another area is really uh, this assessing uh, success area and beginning to think about that. One of the things uh, we're looking at is uh, increasing the utilization of tools like CLEP and DSSP, which used to be Dante's, and things like that for reducing variability. Uh, the idea, we'll be looking at those tools as potential end of course exams. Uh, and this gets back to my point about competency-based. This is not just about adult learners coming in and finding ways to get them credit, but finding ways to really build up the rigor in what we're doing. And my argument is that as we use more tools, more methods, flipped classrooms, online, uh, MOOCs, and things like that, uh, and we have that need for faculty to do things differently, to experiment, we've got to have some consistency across that lets us identify what's working and what's not. And I think that's at the assessment level. The idea of having highly consistent assessments that let us compare across different modes, different methodologies, different pedagogies, I think that's going to be really important uh, for things that we're, we're going to try and accomplish. Uh, I'm also going to talk, just uh, hits back on analytics a little bit. McKinsey, well, now this comes from, uh, from uh, Michael Feinstein, uh, talking about different types of analytics. And I think that's one of our challenges that we have on that. He says that since doing good learning analytics is hard, and I think we'd all agree it is, we often do easy learning analytics and pretend that they are good instead. I, that to me just was real. Uh, captured where we are now with, with analytics uh, and assessments uh, and things. We're just not quite to the point we want to be. So next thing that I'd like to hit you with is this idea, disintermediation. I want to come up with a term that was fun. Uh, and this really is. Uh, this is one of the things that was talked about quite a bit at the MOOC Research in Initiative. And I got one of the statements here from Stephen Downs that kind of hits that idea of what disintermediation is doing to us. And I think we all get this feeling that we're moving towards new systems, that the, the tools, it's no longer enough to just have Blackboard and Banner uh, and, and feel like you've got all the tools you need. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm on a national learning uh, uh, Next Generation Learning uh, Challenge Grant project uh, with Kentucky Community Technical College System called Directed Degree. And when we met with the nine other uh, projects in our wave uh, of that grant program, what we found out is almost all of them were linking together, cobbling together, wiring together different tools. We're working now here in, in Georgia on a pre-calculus 
uh, course that's actually a mashup of a MOOC uh, and a math emporium. And to make that happen, we've got content from Cengage. We're using WebAssign for assessment. We're using Coursera as a platform. We're using Smart Thinking as tutoring. We're bringing in ProctorU for proctoring. Uh, we're using uh, Collaborate uh, for some of the online tutoring. It's kind of what I call Franken structure. We're in this period where now there are so many different things that we're trying to build in. No one particular system has them all, nor arguably should it. So we're building a lot of things together. Uh, I think this also or opens the opportunity uh, for students to be doing a lot more and not just relying on the institutions and on faculty to provide all the services and systems that they work off of. Then uh, looking at a report that McKinsey Global did uh, back in last May, uh, they looked at a lot of social technologies and things and said, you know, this is an area that has huge, huge promise uh, and is just entirely nascent right now. And I think all of us are kind of wondering how this is going to fit in. One of the examples I thought of while I was reading through this, actually two, one is the idea of crowdsourcing, distributed problem solving. And you know, the idea that we look at at undergraduate research and the ability to use social technologies to pull uh, gradu undergraduates into research programs that are real, that are viable, I mean, essentially SETI uh, is the kind of uh, research project you can get involved in without a high level uh, of experience or have a high degree. So these are the kind of things that we know can fit. The interesting thing that uh, uh, McKinsey looked at were companies that had moved from email to more social networking systems, microblogging and things to communicate and send messages back and forth. And in doing that, they were able to uh, analyze the kind of communications that were going on there, where people were having problems, and begin to get uh, run analytics on that kind of information which is a little different than the analytics we think about uh, in terms of a class. And I thought, that is so cool. What if we had an LMS that had a note-taking capability, which we do, uh, and students put their notes on it, and he did analytics on that. That's feedback for a professor of where students are catching things, where they're not, where they're getting things wrong, and it becomes a study aid for students. Well, in typical fashion, uh, I was behind the curve. Uh, and it turns out there's a uh, website called Study Blue where you can go in and do almost exactly that kind of a thing. So I think these are indications of areas where we're going to see some real interesting work in, in kind of these social technologies uh, in different ways than we might traditionally think of them. Then last, uh, what I'm going to be involved in, be, uh, in, in part, because you can't have new learning models without new business models. Uh, we're going to be looking at different ways to think about uh, business models. Uh, we're going to be looking at the impact of this sharing economy that's growing uh, on, on colleges. Uh, what are we going to do about it in business when, in an era where content uh, is free, where the online student uh, has more uh, power, really, than ever, where change, in, in fact, transformational or, or uh, tsunami change uh, is only a mouse click away. These are the kind of things we're going to be looking at, and one in particular we'll be focusing in, in the gen ed area. When we're trying to make things more affordable, that also talks about the depth uh, and changes to the cash cow of education. So these are going to be challenging uh, uh, investigations and discussions, but they're ones that we know are going to happen. I liken this to back in the, in the 90s. Uh, a lot of residential campuses made a substantial amount of money off of the phone lines and phone systems and rental of those uh, to students in dorms. And through the 90s, they saw that revenue decrease, decrease, and then disappear. And when we begin looking at revenues in different course areas, uh, with the, the advent of, while it may not be MOOCs, uh, the expectation and the model uh, for very cost efficient uh, courses uh, we're going to see a lot of cost pressure uh, and a lot of ex expectations uh, in terms of this area. So that's kind of uh, exactly what I've been thinking about. Your future 
uh, may look a little bit different. That's what I'll be focusing on the next year. But I'm pretty sure whatever you're doing, your future is going to have to consider things that are highly accessible, letting students, a wide range of types of students get in, highly affordable. Those cost pressures are not going to go away and highly rigorous. That's my alternative to talking about quality, which is way too broad, way too big, but we can be pretty rigorous and do a good job with this. That's Mike's thoughts for today. Thank you very much, Mike. And might I add, your head looks a lot smaller in that picture than your body, but that might be your intent. Well, I went digital, so. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, there's a few questions. Uh, for example, Van Davis, uh, well, we're teeing up a Pat. Uh, Van Davis had talked about the challenges with uh, infrastructure, and Deb had taken a shot at that in, in text. But uh, Van Davis had asked, in Texas, we've seen that uh, we can get buy-in for faculty to take the lead in developing competencies, bigger challenges with the infrastructure, especially federal financial aid and accreditors. Given those challenges, how do we begin to change the higher education infrastructure to accommodate competency-based education and assessment tools? I want, I'm wondering if you want to take a shot at that, Mike. Well, I, I think part of the focus I've been taking on that has really been on the other end, on the assessment side of that. Uh, we just did a survey of our institutions in Georgia uh, for the uh, looking at the courses that they align with the CLEP exams. And it turns out that there's a, a high degree of commonality and a few uh, uh, bits of diversity in the way they take those kind of courses uh, and, and award credit for them. I think that's the, the, the beginning for a real interesting discussion. Uh, as I was saying about using assessments to begin leading that. And that, I think, helps then kind of focus, I was going to say constrain, but really focus the conversation about competencies. Uh, the, the real challenge is that middleware that you can put a competency down and say, how does this link to an assessment? Uh, and, and how do we uh, link that to the content? And I haven't seen anything, uh, if people have, that allows you to do that in, in a fairly flexible, on-the-fly kind of manner. I think that's the kind of tools that faculty are going to want to start working with. Uh, so that's part of the infrastructure that just isn't there yet. All right, thanks. And we'll probably see more questions about that as we go through. But I want to turn it over to Pat James right now. Hi. Pat, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I am. Can you hear me OK? I, I notice that every time someone steps up to the microphone in, in Collaborate or any conferencing, they ask if they can be heard. Um, it's pretty interesting that <laughs> we're all a little insecure in this environment, no matter how long we've been doing it. Um, first of all, I want to start out with I've been working in the MOOC environment this last year. Uh, at Mount San Jacinto College, we've had a, we had a basic writing MOOC that's been really an experience that has probably changed the lives of those of us who've been involved. Um, it's really interesting to find out that um, it's got a place and it, it, it's, I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, one of the lessons we've learned is, I had to show you this, this is from the um, MOOC Research Initiative Conference uh, that I went to and it was pretty interesting. A lot of talk, talk about what Sebastian Friend had said about, um, you know, he found the magic formula. And so one of the lessons we learned I think is not to say that you found the magic formula because there isn't one. Um, I think as Mike has said, it's a combination of a lot of things and the magic formula, I just don't think there will be one. I think it's a matter of our looking at everything as an opportunity and as educators, I think we're pretty good at that. I'm a real traditional thinker, I think, when it comes to education. I'm looking, you know, coming from a, an administrative point of view, I'm always looking at, okay, what are the FERPA violation issues with this? Or, you know, what's happening with distance ed compared to, um, you know, to anything else that's going on in the environment, and um, particularly when we're looking at engagement with the faculty. So for me, I'm pretty traditional. We've been doing distance learning in California community colleges since in the online format since uh, probably about 1999. And so we have lots of experience, but it came up really from the grassroots. It was, um, 
it was not something that was top down. So that kind of environment says that we're not putting everything together in the beginning. We don't have policies. We don't have all the support mechanisms. We need all of that stuff. Um, it's taken a lot of time for us to develop that. But as Mike said, you know, all of those things need to be put together. And we've been using a variety of tools here for a very long time to do that. What's happened differently is that um, we're dealing with disruption right now. The great thing about the MOOCs was that they caused a huge disruption in education in general, and it brought a lot of attention to distance learning. And that's great, because we're now having some serious conversations about the place for distance ed within a traditional setting. And that's for credit distance ed, which we've been doing for quite a while. Um, we fought, though. We had to fight to do that. Um, you know, fighting people who thought it was going to take their jobs, fighting people who thought it was less rigorous. And that fight, I think, is over. I think we're at a point where now it's coming to the table as a serious methodology, and people are really interested in learning more about it, and that's come out of the MOOC situation. And uh, George Siemens at the MRI uh, said, you know, MOOCs are a purgatory for higher education, which I really liked, because it really is. It's a, it's a stopping place along the road. We don't know what this opportunity is going to do for us. Um, as long as we take advantage of the opportunities they come forward, I think um, as uh, Deb said that the universities and colleges will find their uses for this particular methodology. In California, we're really getting serious about high quality education. And that came out of the, the MOOC environment as well. Our governor wanted to know if we could provide access for our community college students to MOOCs and give them credit. And we had some issues with that. And I think, again, one of the things you mentioned about credit by exam, that's something else we're going to be looking at. How are we going to give credit for these um, MOOCs? And how are we going to distinguish distance ed from correspondence education? And we can't forget that we have federal regulations that we have to abide by, and our creditors are making us do that. So as we go forward, those are the issues, I think, that are going to come up for us. How do we take this type of method and actually take the regulations that we're under and have those regulations fit what we're doing and be reinvented for what we're doing rather than um, have them retrofitted to what we're doing. And if you've, um, if you've been listening to Russ uh, Poland lately, um, you'll recognize that the rules committees are forming around the uh, reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, and we'll see what happens with that. That may have some implications for us, and I hope that they really take into consideration that the landscape is changing. One of the things I noticed this last year that was really pretty interesting is that a, com a global community of practice is forming around these MOOCs. I went to the uh, Coursera Partners Conference back in the spring, and um, one of the things I noticed there was there were people I knew, and I knew them from a variety of other distance ed venues, but now they were here at this MOOC conference. And then at the research initi initiative conference um, last month, the deep freeze of Texas, um, I noticed that I knew a bunch of people there. And there is this group forming, this community of practice forming, where we're all starting to know each other. And we're knowing, we're, we know each other in the context of making what we do in distance ed um, higher quality and understood by more people. And it was really nice to see this group forming, this community of practice forming. And then there will be another conference in London, um, also in I think it's in March, but it might be May. I'll have to take a look. One of those M months. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so as we go forward, I think that the MOOCs will inform us in, in ways that we don't, we don't really even know now and that this global kind of community of practice will help us as well. It's just amazing that I found myself as a community college leader in uh, hangouts with folks from um, Ohio State, Duke, and uh, Michigan, and other colleges across the country that normally I would not have been having a conversation about, with, particularly about you know, sequencing English classes, which is what we were talking about. Um, so to talk a little bit about the learning analytics issue, that's interesting as well, because I think the uh, MOOC providers, I know Coursera, is really working at trying to give us the information we need. It's not quite there yet. And one of the things that we found at the uh, MOOC research initiative was that we have to start coding discussion forms. <coughs> Pardon me. 
And <clears throat> how do we get out of the discussion forums that are in these courses the information about students that we want to know? Why are they taking the classes? What are their goals? Um, what did they, they do that really helped them learn? And what did they benefit from in the course? And so that's one of the pieces that the learning analytics um, hasn't really got to yet is that discussion forum coding. And that's something that um, they're doing at Duke right now is really taking a look at how do we code the information in the discussion forums and make it so that we can understand a little more about who these students are. The global element is just amazing. And when you're in these forums talking to students, it's really quite um, humbling and inspiring to listen to what they have to say. And we have to take a look at that piece, not just the clicks that they do, but also what they're telling us. So I think as that part of the analytics go forward, we're going to be learning a little more. And I think it's going to validate the need for community and interaction. And um, you know, during the time we did our MOOC, we've done it twice now. We're going to um, offer it again in February. Um, we never had a single student talk about concern about getting a degree. They were talking about what they wanted to learn, and they were really interested in being part of the community, particularly a writing community in our case. So I think we're going to find that learning analytics are going to have to inform and validate how we're dealing with community and interaction. And we know that um, there is a piece about engagement in there, too. And Stephen Downs' comment about the LMS belonging to the student um, I think is a little bit off. Um, it may happen, but it and it is happening a little bit more because students are now requiring and needing more engagement. The student of, of I said this minute student is um, not the student of today, but the student of this minute <laughs> um, is requiring more engagement. We need to be able to um, challenge them with activity and you know, getting more involved in learning. And we're seeing that that online piece of engagement, which is a requirement for us, is also feeding into the face-to-face -face environment. And we're starting to see teachers move away from that lecture model and more towards the flipped classroom idea and you know, being more um, responsive to the students that we are seeing right now that are coming out of a standardized learning environment into one where we're asking them to do critical thinking and we can't be doing that in a standard way. We have to change the way we teach. Uh, I was at the uh, Rebooting California meeting last January where um, uh, Gavin Newsom, who is our lieutenant governor in, in California, said, um, you can't teach my three-year-old the way you t taught me. And he said that after he said she uses his iPad all the time. And I thought, you know, that is so true. We can't. And there are a bunch of reasons for that, not just the social media that our students are involved with, but also where they're coming from with the no child left behind situation that we've left now, what we've hopefully left behind. But this, you know, that kind of standardized strategy has caused students to come into our environment wanting to as, um, get a particular grade. They, they've decided what grade they want, and that's all they're going to do. And I think we have to engage them in a way that they understand what we have to offer, and then what we have to offer has to be really valuable. We can't be um, you know, filling the unit box with uh, stuff that's going to provide this much information. We have to fill the unit box with what they need. And I think being involved in the MOOC, taking away that idea of it has to be a certain amount of units and a certain amount of hours and you know, for our faculty was really an interesting challenge for them and one that they just loved. They weren't they weren't held to the Carnegie unit in deciding what students need based on the outcomes that they had um, perceived for the course. So that was a pretty interesting thing. Practically speaking, I think we're going to see um, authentication reemerge as a critical factor. Right now, um, we've, that's been sort of on the back burner, but authenticating students and is going to be something that's very important going forward with all of the open issues about courses. How do we know the student is the student? That's going to be something we're going to have to deal with on a much more technical level than we have been. It was set aside for a while um, by the Department of Education. I think it's going to come back. And I think that's something we need to be prepared for. It's going to cost us. So I think we really need to be prepared for that. 
Um, I just noticed this morning that on the um, illiterate blog, Michael Feldstein was uh, talking about security with the LMS, and it was about the transparency of Canvas in having a security op audit for their LMS. That's another real practical issue. You know, we're facing um, having to have secure secure uh, tools when we're educating our students that that's again something that's in regulation and so I think that's something we need to watch for is which of our LMSs are giving us that information and if they're not we need to ask them for it. So I think that's something else that we have to deal with. And last is this uh, idea of the non-cognitive side of our students' needs and you know they're coming into the online environment not knowing how to be online students if they're coming straight out of high school. That's going to change um, as we go forward but we need to be um, watchful of that and be sure that we know how to prepare them to be good online students and they need that for industry as well because as they go forward you know the days of professional development face to face in a big um, a business ha are gone and they're using e-learning a lot more and we're going to have to make sure that our students really understand what that means for them. So I see us you know, looking at preparing students a lot more than we have in the past and sharing that information um, and working together a whole lot more. Um, we just found out in California that we have an 11.4% increase in our budget and California has um, put a lot of money into distance learning. Uh, right now, we're going to do a course exchange that is like load balancing for those of you who understand the technical term. It's if you have a, if you have a course at a college in Northern California that, doesn't, that isn't full and one in Southern California that's impacted, students are going to be able to take that course seamlessly online and that's what we're working on, but around that will be all of the support mechanisms, including the orientation piece, and I think it's really great that the time has come for that. Um, that was in a press release just today, so um, the 11.4 percent issue. The, um, the online education initiative cal in California is something to watch. And I think that's where I'm going to start. All right, thanks very much. And right on the heels of that discussion, Pat, Mike Aviati from SREB asks, what was the distribution of enrollees in your MOOC and did you have a wide age range? And, and I'll just throw in, is there anything else you can throw in about what was unique about it? Um, yeah, you know, we did have a wide age range. As a matter of fact, we had one discussion where someone said, I think I'm the youngest person here, I'm 11. And I mean, I'm 13 and somebody else came in and said, no, I'm 11. And then someone else came in and said, well, I'm 72. And so the initial person, the 13-year-old, came back and said, knowledge has no age. And I think that was really pretty interesting. And we have a lot of information. I don't have that in front of me. Um, but I can post that. So. Um, uh, Megan, maybe we can work at getting that data out um, to people. It'll be coming up pretty soon. It, w it was a, a wide range of people. I think the majority of our folks were between the ages of 22 and 35. Um, but there were a lot of folks who were there just because they wanted to write better. It had nothing to do with school. Um, so that was pretty interesting. The other thing that in response to you um, about it being interesting was that um, we had people who said that the only way that they could get education was this way. And I think that was really something that kind of tugged at our heartstrings. Um, we noticed that there were a lot of things forming outside of our course. For example, Facebook groups sprung up. Um, there were Twitter feeds that we didn't, we did not start those, but our students did. So they were forming their own communities. I think there was a huge need for community. And I, you know, people ask me why I got into it and I, my answer is that I want, I want to live in a world where people can read and they're smart and can make their own decisions. I think the planet, our planet's uh, health depends on that. So that's why I'm involved and I think that's what we're going to see happening more as students who are in these big classes talk to each other across the globe. All right, thanks. Um, I have, so you guys all touched on this and I'm kind of curious, I have a sophomore in college and a kid who's about to graduate and go to college and so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I don't quite know how to phrase this, student, uh, this question other than to say if we were to ask a student what the future looks like, um, and this is for everybody and, and we'll start back with Deb, um, you know in terms of on the ground and what students 
what knowledge they're bringing to campus and how the, uh, how are they driving things? Uh, somebody I read an article that says Facebook is now dying, and you know how do they know they're using the next LMS? And can we trust them uh, to bring the right tools? So uh, again, I'll throw it to Deb first, but I'm curious what you how you think students, both traditional and non-traditional, are going to be driving what we do in the future. Well, I know that we've run into, um, we've had some focus groups on some of the technology they were thinking about bringing into the um, institution here. And, you know, the comments that came out in a recent meeting was, you know, the, they were asked questions about whether they use it as the student say, but we expect this. So we're, we're seeing that our students are coming in expecting that they're going to be able to use the technology they like. They expect that there will be different kinds of interaction, technology used in the classroom, that it's not going to be uh, their faculty member just lecturing to them. So I think that in a, a lot of more traditional institutions, much like Ohio is, that that is a change in mindset that we're going to have to be dealing with. And then your comment about Facebook being dead, and I had seen some information about that too. But you know what I find that you know it's, our, it's the adult learners who are the strong Facebook users now. Our younger students are you know it's not going to be their tool. They'll have something else. But the communities that we have forming in Facebook um, or R and BSN programs just one pro um, uh, example of that. They started their own Facebook page for the program. And we go out and check it every once in a while just to see, you know, what's happening with it because they really created their own community on their own. Even though we were trying to do things to, to try to help to create a sense of community for the nursing students, they have done it themselves. So I think we'll see Facebook be still used, but it's, there is going to be different populations than what it has been before. But, but it's really, there's a lot of expectations, as, as um, Pat said about the minute student. Um, there's more immediacy, there's more interaction that they want, um, engagement, and we, you know, higher education has been struggling to meet those needs. Thank you very much, Deb. Mike, you want to take a shot at the future according to students? But you know, when I think about it, uh, I, I love uh, if you were at the WCET uh, summit on OER a uh, year, year and a half ago now in Salt Lake City. Uh, Glenda Morgan talks about uh, talked to us there about free range learners and the way she looks at those. And there's a large percentage of learners who are, uh, I think the term she used was ambivalent. Uh, about what they're doing, and, and I, I think that's where we're trying to find things that are engaging, uh, and certainly students are finding things that are engaging. If you've ever tried to get a 14-year-old to stop uh, playing Minecraft uh, or getting uh, FaceTime sessions uh, requests at two in the morning from friends. Uh, you, you realize that uh, the the power of the social nature uh, of these things um, is really strong. And as Deb was saying, the kids are coming in very familiar with that. But at some point in the program, they become very attuned to risk. And what we right now do is make almost every use of technology extremely high risk. Uh, a simple example is uh, students know very well you absolutely never cite Wikipedia uh, in anything you do because that is the kiss of death, whether it's right or not. Uh, so you know we have a, a, a culture of boomers and, and other folks uh, as educators, uh, especially in higher ed, that really are not uh, as, as accepting of that. So. You know, I think uh, as as uh, I think it was Deb was saying, yeah, probably uh, the LMS is less likely to be student driven as long as you know faculty are are able to control that. But I think that's what we're seeing that the uh, the kids are really uh, beginning to do their own things anyway and finding ways of working around that even it, though we present it and try to make it a high risk environment for them to go outside the rules and outside the lines. I think we'll see more of that, uh, especially 
and, and I say this uh, more pragmatically than, than uh, in a positive way, uh, kids are looking for the quickest way uh, to get to the completion of that course uh, with the uh, least amount of effort. Or, you know, saying that another way, the most highly efficient way to show competency sufficient to uh, complete that course. And uh, they're going to find ways to do that. Uh, we know that if we've ever tried to stop them from cheating. So it's, it's going to be an interesting world and a, and a strong dynamic. Where that tipping point is, we don't know yet. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, Pat, I, I'll give you a shot if you want to say any more about uh, students. I, I'll call attention to Deb Everhart's comment that the ma majority of students are now post-traditional. You know, what is how is that going to affect uh, you know the the business that we're in for both residential and non-residential universities uh, in place and at a distance? And I realized that was a mouthful of question. That's for Pat. And we might have lost her oh. audio. Oh. There you go. I think we lost Pat. It looked like Mike was going to jump in. Mike, do you have something to add? Oh, Pat, can you back. hear me now? Can yep. you guys hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, I think that what's going on um, for me is my my son is a a senior in high in college right now at CSU, and he came into college with no idea of what college was about. And um, I remember talking to him and his friends one day, and I said, well, is there more work in college? And they said, oh, no, there was more work in high school. And through further conversation, we found out that the definition of work for them was different than what I was talking about. They said there's a lot of studying, but there's not much work. And so that was an interesting thing to think about is what their perceptions of what we have to offer really are. And we have to make sure that we understand that. I was fortunate enough to be in a course with uh, a friend of mine, Belinda Hyden Scott, one day. And it's a face-to-face -face class. And it was business uh, communications class. And she actually doing presentations. And she asked students to take their phones out. And she did poll everywhere to find out a little bit about them and found out that 60% of her students were taking her course because it was the only one with seats available. And I thought, you know, that's a real interesting thing to know. But <laughs> when she was finished with that, she, she said, keep your phone out. And here's a Twitter hashtag. And what I want you to do is that every time you have an aha moment or you learn something new, I want you to tweet it. And then you can go home and you can collect those tweets. And those will be the notes for today's class. And one of the students said, thank you. This is the best class I've ever been in. And the class was like an hour old. You know, it was pretty surprising to me. But, but another student said, thank you for recognizing that this is something that we do well. I can, I can text faster than I can write. And I can do it while I'm thinking of other things. And that was a really, uh, really informative moment for me about where our students are coming from. So I think when you look at students, what you're going to find out is that they really need to understand what we're asking them to do. And we need to make sure that what we're asking them to do is relevant. You know, for example, if you, if you are putting in your syllabus as an instructor what the um, consequences of cheating and plagiarism are, but you're not telling them why it's important that they don't cheat and that they do their own work, why it's important to them and what it means to you and what it means to the value of their subsequent education and degree, then I think you're doing a disservice because the students really need to understand what we value, why we value it, and how we can get that information to them. So there. And I think I mentioned the Evolve Summit, by the way, that's going to be happening on the 17th in LA. If you can get to that, I think you can still register for it. And that's going to be listening to students about what they need and what they want going forward. OK. Um, Megan, do we have time for maybe one more question? Or do you want to do some housekeeping? Sure, no, go right ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, I um, there's been a certain amount of, of discussion about the, the changing role of the instructor. Are, I, I think this might be a repeat, but just so, so quickly, I'll throw it out for any of our panelists. Are 
are we prepared, are faculty prepared to, to become uh, mentors and collaborators? Uh, are we going to start to see schisms among the faculty ranks between the sort of the techno savvy haves and have nots? And is this going to be an issue in terms of both understanding these trends and then being able to adopt them? Richie, this is Deb. I'll take a stab at that. I think there are a lot of faculty that have to change some mindsets about what they think higher education is and should be to kind of meet up with our new students, you know, be it you know, traditional age or the, the new traditional that is a little bit of an older student. But the, the, you know, one of the things that I've been dealing with a lot is, is the fact that you know, we get pushed about what are the skill sets employers are looking for. And that when you do employer surveys, they say, well, the students don't have the skill set they need in the workplace. And when you're in the workplace, you use the same kind of skill sets that our students are coming in with, that they can go out there and they can search and they can find the answers and things like that. So I think students, or I think faculty, have to get to the point where they are collaborators and they teach the kind of skill sets that they're going to use. Help them identify what's good information when they're out on the web. You know, help them make that bridge between the content they need to know, how they find and use that content, and how to be prepared to use that in the workplace. So yeah, I think there's going to be a huge change in, in the mindset in higher education faculty that I don't think they really understand is coming their way. Thanks, Deb. Mike or Pat? This is Mike. This is I'll, Mike. I'll jump in real quick and I'll say the faculty that we're working with on our pre-calculus uh, MOOC Math Emporium mashup, uh, they're ready to do these things. They're interested in doing those things. Once you get into it and begin thinking about uh, the correlations to what they really do in the classroom, uh, they get really uh, engaged and excited about it. Uh, but it takes uh, some uh, guidance and mentoring uh, for them. Uh, our, our, one of our interesting challenges, we'll have a team of six uh, faculty teaching this online course, which is really all the questions go into a student, uh, into a discussion forum. It's sort of a MOOC style because it's on Coursera uh, method. And uh, partway through our design, the faculty all said, well, but wait a minute, when are our office hours going to be? And we really had to have a, we had a great discussion uh, about the fact that they were virtual office hours and how we were going to handle that. So, you know, it, 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 in part, it just takes some discussions to pull through. But we have always and always will, I think, count on faculty to really do creative, innovative things that we can't design in without being there and knowing what they know. I just want to chime in and say it's about okay. culture. It's about the culture of your institution and honoring the faculty for what they know, bringing them in, compensating them wherever you can, but building a culture that is is based on professional development and professional respect. And I, I think that at our college, we have done that over the years. We had a professional development program that grew but was always there for them. And so we have a very strong culture of acceptance of innovation and technology. And I think that as, as that becomes more um, uh, prevalent in higher in the higher levels at the uh, universities, the community colleges have always been kind of there, but at the universities I think we're going to see faculty coming on board. Some never will, and we let them be. And we really work with those who will. All right. Thank you very much, Pat. And I want to say thanks very much to our, all of our panelists, Deb, Mike, and Pat, for their incisive and insightful thoughts. Uh, and uh, I want to turn it over to Megan for some last minute housekeeping. I want to thank Richie. He did a wonderful job as moderator. So thank you, Richie. And thank you to all of our panelists. And thank you to the participants for joining us today. We had some very active and good discussion take place. This session is being recorded. I'll send the link and the resources out next week. It will also be posted on our WCET website. So a year from now, we can go back and see how accurate our visionaries are with their crystal ball reading. Thank you to Blackboard Collaborate for making the platform available. I want to thank our WCET supporting members, Boise State, Colorado State University, Dal Lonas, Lone Star College System, Michigan State University, Mizzou Online, University of North Texas, and University of West Georgia. Our annual sponsors, Cengage, CourseSmart, Pearson, 
and vital source. And then I also want to mention that we have a few upcoming webcasts. We have one on state authorization coming up on January 23rd. And then we have a, another webcast in early February on how you can bring the campus experience to your online students. So visit the WCT website for more information. And again, thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you more here in 2014.